Being the comfort of the spirit of truth, who out of our present fills all things, treasure good things, and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from all purity and save our souls, a good one. I mean, well, this coming Sunday, brothers and sisters, will mark the final Sunday before the beginning of Lent. We've passed through a great deal of time very quickly. And accordingly, seeing how it is the last Sunday before we begin the Lenten fast, we will commemorate according to the tradition of the Holy Orthodox Church, the exile of the first created ones, of Adam and Eve, of our first parents, their exile we will mark from the Garden of Paradise, which, according to the Synaxarian, demonstrates, not by simple words, but by actual deeds, how beneficial fasting is to man and how harmful and destructive are insatiety, that is uncontrolled eating, and the transgression of the divine commandments. So according to the Synaxarian, this commemoration which we mark will show us two things. On the one hand, it will show us the benefit of fasting, and on the other, it will show us the harm that comes from being a disobedient child of the church and not partaking of the holy fast. But how does it demonstrate this? How does the exile of our first parents show us the importance of keeping the commandments generally, but more particularly, the importance of keeping our Lenten fast? Let us begin here then, brothers and sisters. In paradise, Adam and Eve partook of a beautiful life, indeed a life so beautiful it's beyond expression though not something we should cast out of our minds by the virtue of its surpassing beauty. Yet the friend, for example, in one of his books, writes a long chapter commending to Orthodox Christians the practice of meditating on the reality and the beauty of paradise, particularly by looking at the nature around. He uses the example of springtime, of seeing the beauty that's expressed in spring and using that tangible example that stands before us as a way of thinking of the beauty of paradise. If what God has left for us in this fallen world can be so beautiful, how much more beautiful must life in paradise have been? So anyway, within the context of this inexpressible beauty lived our first parents, Adam and Eve. And apart from all the other inexpressible beauties, their life was characterized primarily by one thing. It was primarily characterized by the beauty of unity with God and by his dwelling in their hearts by grace, which was expressed outwardly by the garments of light which our first parents wore when they were in paradise and in communion with God. Now this beautiful life, which we have said, stands beyond any possible description and bears only shaded likenesses to the fallen order we see around us. This beautiful life had but one condition if it was to remain the condition of life of humanity forever. God gave Adam and Eve but one commandment through which they were to signify their submission to him and their desire to remain in that beautiful condition they found themselves in. And this command was as follows. We read in Genesis. Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. One commandment he gave to them. God gave them but one commandment, to keep the fast. He permitted, permitted them to eat many things, but to abstain from just one, just as in the Lenten fast that we're about to partake of in a few days, doesn't starve us, but steers us away from particular foods. The fast, St. Basil the Great writes, is man's sintorphos, his schoolyard chum, we might say. Their histories, the history of humanity and the fast, are deeply intertwined and go right back to the very beginning of history. And so then, brothers and sisters, if the first created ones had kept the fast, they would have remained in that beautiful life, the life of paradise, unto the ages. So from this perspective then, the commemoration we're going to mark this coming Sunday shows us the great benefit of fasting. But as we all know well by now, brothers and sisters, Adam and Eve did not keep this fast. 
they didn't keep this commandment of God. They listened instead to the voice of the man-hating serpent, the devil, and they ate of the tree, breaking their fast, and thus the grace of God departed from them. They became mortal and subject to death, and God exiled them from paradise to inspire repentance in them so that they might someday be capable of returning. And herein then we get the flip side of the coin. Herein we are shown the great sorrow, the great damage that is incurred by the breaking of the fast. So in this event then, the Holy Church sets before us, which it is going to set before us this coming Sunday, we have a tangible historical example of the joys that fasting promise and in the sorrow that comes from our not partaking of the fast and of our breaking it. And thereby, in seeing this example set before us by this yearly commemoration, we are encouraged to embrace the Lenten fast, not to imitate the fall of our first parents, and to uh, partake of the fast in all seriousness and in all sobriety, with this historical reality set before our eyes. Now, as further encouragement to this, to the particular commemoration of the exile in Adam and Eve, of Adam and Eve uh, from the life of paradise, and generally to set ourselves more diligently to the work of the spiritual life, to the keeping of the commandments, in other words, the Church has also set before us an epistle reading taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And I'm just going to take a second for us to read this together now because it's on the actual epistle for this Sunday that we're going to focus for the rest of our time together tonight. So the epistle that we'll hear on this coming Sunday is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the 13th chapter beginning at the 11th verse up to uh, chapter 14, verse 4. So I'll just read it now so we have it in our minds. St. Paul writes, And do this, knowing the time that now, is, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but do not uh, dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. And who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So that's the epistle that we'll hear read in church this coming Sunday. And so let's begin to go through it piece by piece looking as we usually do at the comments here and there from our Father among the Saints, John Chrysostom, in order to understand a little bit of the depth of what St. Paul is getting at here. And so the Holy Apostle begins, Now it is high time to awaken out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. This, St. Chrysostom comments, is indeed an expression of the shortness of time that stands before us something which is quite a common expression in the Holy Apostles' writings. However, St. Chrysostom points out, most times he uses this expression in order to encourage people to endure, endure difficulty. He reminds them of the shortness of time so that they'll endure the afflictions that they are faced with. Here, however, this is not the case. Here, the Holy Apostle has a different purpose for calling our attention to the shortness of time. His intention here, Holy Chrysostom tells us, is to rouse us to action, to rouse those to whom he writes to action, and to inspire them to begin laboring in the spiritual life. It is time to awake, he writes. In other words, it is time to get moving, to focus on the spiritual life, on those things that will bring us close to God, and on those things that will make us open to the reception of divine grace. Because now, he writes, salvation is nearer than when we first believed. 
Now commenting on the second piece, St. Chrysostom writes that he does not mean here saying salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He does not mean that unequivocally without effort that all will be saved. On the contrary, he contrasts this and says, but rather this means that the moment of judgment when we have potential to be saved is nearer than when we first came to the faith. So St. Paul is not saying that all will be saved. He's saying that the moment of potential salvation grows closer, both in the sense of our personal repose, because we are all going to eventually die. This is when we'll come to face the particular judgment. This is indeed now closer for all of us than it was when we first believed. We are indeed closer to our repose than we were yesterday or the day before, but also in a secondary sense, in the sense that history itself is moving towards its end because it is a basic Christian teaching as we've reiterated over and over again that at some point in history, history itself will end and the universal resurrection will take place followed by the final judgment as we emphasized in last week's uh, readings. No doubt in all the homilies you heard preached in the various churches. So moving on from this general emphasis of the shortness of time, which St. Chrysostom tells us is designed to inspire activity in, uh, in his readers, St. Paul continues, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. The apostle here continues his call to action using the image of night and then day. And St. Chrysostom tells us that he uses this image for three basic reasons. And we'll focus on these three basic reasons for the rest of our time together here. The first reason St. Paul uses this night day imagery. He says, this is an example that all will recognize. And he gives us the basis upon which most of his readers would have recognized this at the time. He says a farmer, for example, if he is to get all the work he needs to get done finished during the course of the day, he cannot wait for the sun to get to rise and then to get dressed and to make his breakfast and to have his coffee and then leave for the fields at 10 a.m. and hope to get done what he was planning on doing. This is impossible for the farmer. No, rather what he has to do is he has to wake up when it is yet dark and do all of his preparations and be at the field to begin work when the first semblance of light shows in order that he can use the entirety of the day for his labor and not fail on his task. So the night is far spent and the day is at hand means that we have absolutely no time to waste in terms of the work that we have to do for our salvation. For most of us, brothers and sisters, I fear that in a sense, if we really look at ourselves, we'll say that the day is already at hand and we have not yet to begun to prepare for the labor we need to do. And what are these basic preparations? What are the fundamental presuppositions, we might say, that we as Orthodox Christians might go out into the, the field of our souls and labor for our salvation? What are the things that ought, have, ought to have been done already in order for us to do this? These basic preparations, we are told, are first the keeping of the fasts of the church. This is something we should have pushed fast. We should be doing this already. We should also be keeping our prayer rule diligently without straying from it. We should not miss services, especially the services on Sunday, which are days of obligation for Christians. And we should confess our sins to our spiritual fathers regularly without letting large periods of time elapse. These are the getting dressed, the having our coffee, all those preparatory actions that need to happen before we can go out to the field so we can just be ready to start the activity of purification of the soul. These are things that must be in place as groundwork. These are the basic things we must be doing before we can truly begin labor. Now, most of us are beginning our preparations then after the light of day has already broken. And therefore, we must begin to labor intensely and to make up for lost time. We have no time to set up because we started even later than we should by not having done the basic preparations in our spiritual lives. So we have to labor all the more intensely to make use of the daylight that God has provided before us. Hurry, writes St. Herman of Alaska, for it is later than you think. So that is the first reason that St. Paul uses this image 
of night and day, according to St. John Chrysostom, to drive that point home, that point home further with us. The second reason St. Chrysostom says is because he wants us to understand that the things of this present life, which are not connected with our, our spiritual improvement and with the goal of salvation, all of these things, brothers and sisters, belong to the night and are therefore, as part of the night, simply dreams. The things of this life that are not connected with our salvation, the things that are not connected with our spiritual improvement are as dreams. They have no substance and they will pass away just as night passes into day, just as dreams fade when we wake up. Why would we live our lives focused solely on our job or on our money or with food or with carnal things when at a certain moment we know that we are going to awake and that we are going to see that those things were completely insubstantial, that they have no being, that they are worthless. Why would we spend all of our time on those things that are going to pass away just as quickly as a dream disappears when we go from asleep to awake? It is spiritual cultivation which will remain. It is the prayers we've said that we've labored to say throughout our lives. The sacrifices that we've made for the sake of others, for our family, for our neighbor. These are the things that will last. It is the fearlessness with which we keep Christ's teachings, even when others ridicule us for having done this. These will remain. All of the rest are dreams that will scatter when we awaken. So it is a call then, as St. Chrysostom writes, to put off imaginings, to get clear of these dreams of the past, of the present life, and to look towards those things that are of true substance. So we've seen two reasons, St. Chrysostom says, that uh, the Holy Apostle Paul uses these two, uh, this image of night and day. Now the final intention behind this night-day image emerges in what St. Paul says in the rest of today's epistle. In addition, he writes to being a reminder of the shortness of time and of the transitory, the dreamlike nature of the pleasures and passions of this life. It is also a call to cast off works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. And he lists some of these works of darkness as we read in continuation. Revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, envy. Now explaining this list, St. Chrysostom returns to the discussion of the passions raised by St. Paul a few weeks ago. In fact, it might have been the last time I was with you when we talked about the epistle. St. Paul, he says, does not here condemn proper Christian gatherings, but rather revelry. It's important that we note this. He doesn't condemn proper Christian gatherings, but revelry. He doesn't condemn wine, but drunkenness. He doesn't condemn marital relations, but simply their use outside of marriage and their perversion in the mind in terms of lust. That is to say, he does not condemn lawful things, but rather he condemns lawful things that have been abstracted from God's purposes and which, as we said last time, are the focus of passions. This is where passions arise when we take the good things of this world and we abstract them from God and they start to actually become impediments to our relationship with God. Then these good things become a, become a passion that can grow even so fearful that someday, if we're presented with the very choice between God and the passion itself, we would choose the passion. They become competing loves. And in place of a life of darkness, because St. Paul never leaves us empty, he always fills us up after he's taken things away, in place of this life of darkness, these passions, these things that we shouldn't be cultivating, St. Paul adds something to us. He calls us to live in the light of day, that is, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss, which means to put on the whole band of virtues as these are expressed in the person of Christ. And these virtues, let us know, St. Paul calls armor, St. Chrysostom points out. That these virtues that are the imitation of Christ are called the armor of light, for they protect the soul Unto what? Unto salvation. 
They become as armor because they guard us on the path that leads to salvation and keeps us safe on that path. And this is why he calls evil works simply works, but he changes his language and calls the works of virtue and imitation of Christ armor. So if nothing else then remains with us this coming week as we look at the epistle a reading appointed to, uh, for this Sunday from the Holy Apostle Paul, let us take this. First, that the day, as he says, is near at hand. Preparation should be made, for it is time for us to go out to the field of our souls uh, before the opportunity passes. So let us get on those basic things. Lent is a good time for this. Return to those basic things that we ought to have already been doing. But take the opportunity Lent provides to go back to the prayer room, to go back to the reading of scripture, to go back to confessing regularly, to go back to uh, not missing church services and all these kinds of things. Make these preparations and then knowing that we've started the preparations late and they cut into our daytime to make our labor throughout the rest of Lent all the more intense to make up what, whatever ground we've lost. Secondly, from what St. Paul has told us, we have to work to clear away the weeds of the passions, which have grown as a result of our improper relationships to the things of this life, our relations to things abstracted from God. And lastly, we also have to work to put on the virtues. We have to actively come to know the life of Christ in order that we might see opportunities to imitate him in this life and thereby guard ourselves on the path to salvation with the armor of his virtue. So that's a few notes that I had put together based on some things St. Chrysostom wrote. Uh, from there on, if we wanna just have any discussion about things, uh, we can open up to that. Um, if we stay away from all the foods that we're supposed to stay away from during the fast, but eat a lot and are pretty much gluttonous with the foods that we can eat, is that a form of breaking the fast? I, I missed the end. I, I, so I was wondering if, if we're gluttonous with the food. No? If we're gluttonous with the foods that we can eat is that, uh, and still overeating, is that a form of breaking the fast? Yeah, definitely, because the, the, uh, the whole content of the fast is, has a spiritual purpose. The aim of the fast is a spiritual purpose, which is the renovation of, of, of our soul, so the, the restructuring of our souls to the proper order. Um, so if we're, if we're falling into sins, I mean, it's not only that. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Just give me one second. There's a really good hymn. Uh, from the Triodian that we just sang, I can't remember whether it's yesterday or today, and I'll I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, but the, I mean, it sort of destroys the spiritual purpose of the fast when we're willingly falling into other forms of sins uh, during the course of it. But this hymn was particularly beautiful, and uh, I'd like to read it if I can find it. Um, uh, here's this is good. Um, this is one of the hymns that we just heard uh, tonight, actually. It was tonight at Vespers. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm getting tons of static. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is one of the hymns that we just heard at, uh, at Vespers tonight. If thou dost fast from food, my soul, yet dost not cleanse thyself from the passions, let us rejoice in vain over, th over thine abstinence. For if thy purpose is not turned towards amendment of life, as a liar thou art hateful in God's sight, and thou dost resemble the evil demons who never eat at all. Do not by sinning make the, make the fast worthless, but firmly resist all wicked impulses. Picture to thyself that thou art standing beside the crucified Savior, or rather that thou art thyself crucified with him who was crucified for thee, and cry out to him, remember me, O Lord, when thou comest in thy kingdom. So, I mean, the point is, the point is very clearly laid out in this hymn. Um, yes, we fast from food, that's the outward practice of the fast, but there's an inner content of the fast that's supposed to be going on at the same time, which is the cleansing of ourselves and the passions. Gluttony is another, pa is a passion, 
uh, equal to all others. So if we're becoming gluttonous with the, the food we are able to eat, we're not accomplishing the spiritual purpose of the fast at all. And, uh, you know, like as the hymn says, uh, we shouldn't rejoice in vain over our abstinence because we're, we're cultivating more and more fa passions in the process. What if we see within ourselves, say, two or three, that's probably more, but two or three predominant passions? How do we attack them? Because my understanding is a passion is something that you've committed over a period of time, many times without even knowing. And as you mentioned in the past, in your old homilies is because we actually like it. That's why we do it. And then it becomes a, a habit within us. How do we, how do we attack that from that bad habit? How do we, how do we, where do we do that battle? How do we do that battle? Well, I mean, we have to, the first thing the fathers say generally about the war with the passions um, I mean, we're talking about three from the beginning. The first thing St. Nicodemus says is we have to isolate one to work on in particular. Um, yes, we can't sort of allow ourselves to be unapologetic about the rest of our spiritual lives and sort of let things go by the wayside entirely. Uh, but he says the general solution is to find, you know, obviously with the discernment of our spiritual father, find one particular passion that we really need to make the focus of our attention. Um, so as not to disperse our energy over a whole bunch of different things and end up losing, uh, not making any progress anywhere because we spread ourselves too thin. Um, so the first task then would be with the spiritual father to identify uh, usually uh, what is the most dangerous of the passions uh, that, that we're sort of manifesting in whatever form and sort of go at it particularly. Um, as to how we approach it from a step-by-step -step basis, that one passion once we've chosen it or once we've isolated it with the discernment of our spiritual father, uh, often, it, I mean, it goes the way sort of Elder Joseph describes. So if we take something like anger, for example, um, we know that passions have both an inner and an outer content. They aren't sort of, uh, because they become so deep, yes, there's external manifestations of them. Uh, like for anger, for example, the external manifestation might be yelling and throwing things and stomping around like a fool. Um, there's inner manifestation in terms of the thought processes and things that go along with that outer expression. Um, so what, what Elder Joseph recommends in a lot of his writings, if you've read his, his letters, Elder Joseph says something about um, basically suffocating the snake in your throat. So stopping the outer expression first. Um, so the first step would be to, to, to eliminate the outer expression, realizing that when I eliminate the external forms of that, of that passion, external expressions, there's still going to be an underbelly that's there uh, that I still have to work on. But my first task is going to be to chop off the head, not give in, uh, you know, two or three times in a row. And St. John Chrysostom, in fact, points this out. Uh, if we can get to the point where maybe two or three times in a row we stop the external manifestation of the passion, uh, God will see our effort and he'll give us grace. And that grace will allow us to turn and sort of start purifying the inner man more clearly. Um, so with most of the passions, the first step is to eliminate the outward expression. And by outward, we don't necessarily just mean outward publicly. It can be just outward in terms of whatever whatever the, the action is, um, because there's lots of passions that are done secretly in private, but they're still, they still have an outward expression. Um, so eliminate the outward expression. Try to string two or three of those victories sort of together. And in, in doing that, sort of acquire God's blessing and grace. And then begin to sort of turn turn our focus more intensely on the thoughts and and inner elements associated with the passion. So that's a rough sort of outline of how we would treat passions generally. Isolate the one that, that seems to be the most dangerous, or that the spiritual father discerns is the one we need to really go at, um, because he may see a relationship that we don't see uh, between it and something else. Uh, pick the one, and then first start to ex the fight the ex the external manifestations. And then through through that process of beating back the external manifestations, acquiring a bit of grace, and then going more harshly at the inner inner things associated with it, the thoughts and other things associated with it. So that's a general outline, not applying to anyone in particular. Yes, I can hear. Uh, when you go to church on a regular basis, sometimes the uh, Greek uh, symbolio, the the council there, whatever church you're in, might ask you to help out for the day. 
you know, mm-hmm. can- candles, moving chairs. Right. And, and sometimes it can take you away from the actual Sunday service because you're busy helping the church. Sure. Pray or not the way you'd like. What do you suggest? Like, what are ways of getting around there? I mean, I guess you can always do the Jesus prayer, but yeah. is there anything else you can kind of suggest to make it uh, that Sunday satisfying uh, spiritually instead of kind of feeling like you never really uh, enjoyed the liturgy? Well, um, it depends, I guess, on the situation a little bit. If it's a situation where we're going every single Sunday and there's always, uh, you know, always the task seems to be getting sort of consistently put on us without it being dispersed, for example, maybe there's a there's an issue there of you know speaking to some people and maybe saying, look, uh, I in my own weakness, I would like to have an opportunity to just come to liturgy and pray. Is there any way we could distribute these responsibilities a little a little more, uh, just for my own weakness, because I'm I, I don't feel like this is good for me. Um, you know, approaching it in humility, sort of saying, not not acting like this is something that's just been thrust on me, but rather for my weakness, I feel like I would like a Sunday where I can, you know, one out of the four where I can just uh, just pray without distraction. Um, but the other thing I think generally we have to remember, uh, if we look at the monastic model, if we go to the monasteries, there's sisters that serve or and fathers who serve all the time. I mean, they don't stop. I, I you know, you go to the you go to the monastery and there's there's consistently monks that have to work in the kitchen throughout all the services. You know, if we go to uh, you know, even the, in, within the the female or the women's monasteries, you have nuns that have to serve in the altar. They have to be running around constantly, getting things for the priest. They're getting you know, getting everything ready. Uh, you know, paying it. They have to. Their mind always has to be on the things they need. The priest needs because the priest doesn't have a server or something like that. Um, the reality is, I think. If you go back to what you said about the Jesus prayer, you can pretty effectively, I think, uh, console yourself looking to the model of the monastics and be laboring while you're in church and still have a spiritually fruitful experience during the Sunday liturgy. Um, but again, it, it depends on the, on your situation and your own spiritual condition and what your spiritual father thinks is best for you. If you if you really feel knotted up about that. And you go to your spiritual father, your spiritual father may say something like, you know what, for you, maybe it is important that you not do something like this. And he may give you a blessing to go and say, look, I just don't, for me, this doesn't work. I'm, I'm too weak. I really need the time to just be away from things and, con- and concentrating. Um, if that's not our case, though, like I said, I think we can, rec- or we can console ourselves a little bit by thinking of how do the monastics have to, uh, you know, they've gone away from the world theoretically in order to, to sort of work out their salvation. And they're working like dogs. Um, so we can console ourselves a little bit with that example. You know, if we get asked to do a few small tasks on, on a Sunday at church, uh, I don't think it has to be the end of the world. If we approach it in the right spirit, I think it can be it can be fine for us. And if we pray using the prayer throughout the whole the whole time we're doing these tasks, we can turn it into a spiritually fruitful uh, event. I mean, I look at my own my own matushka. Uh, she's out of earshot, so I can say it nobody nobody runs around as much as she does i mean literally she doesn't stop from the from the beginning of matins until the end of divine liturgy she's running constantly and i can say in honesty that that is not a spiritually unfruitful thing for her sometimes i wish it was different for her but it's not a spiritually unfruitful thing because of the way in which she does it so it's up to us. Uh, it's up to us and our spiritual father, of course, depending on our condition. Um, so I recommend number one, ask your spiritual father what what he thinks you should be doing. Uh, but number two, that it is indeed, if you think of the example of the monastics, it's quite possible to serve in that capacity, be doing those kinds of things, and still leave the end of liturgy having been benefited, and not feeling like it was just a draining experience. I, if I may uh, return to the question, sure. I began taking a course. Did, did we get it close enough? Like that? I, I can hear. I can hear. All right. Perfect. I began taking a course last night, and the um, 
the focus of the course overall is uh, some sort of what I call it internal correction to things done wrong. And the idea begins with nurture as to what nurture is. And as I thought about this, because what followed was reference to abuse. It's like if it isn't nurturing, then it's going to turn to abuse or neglect, which is a form of abuse. Now, I, my brain quickly recalls something that Paul made reference to about uh, watchful, uh, vigilant, self-control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I say this because I think um, the passions run rampant in the unschooled or the unnurtured, and people are going around whacking other people. Uh, it's like they they're not aware of the passions and you re you give us a key right away as to how to remedy the matter but the key isn't presented to their framework of thinking or to ours or we can't recall it so i think this is it's like sometimes the answer is so simple yeah we can't grasp it so. <laughs> Um, is is it better to pray during the liturgy or to to, to follow along in the service books if, if it's done in a language that you don't understand? Well, I mean, there's no if it's in the language you don't understand. Well, I'm, I'm, like for example, for example, yeah, I, I'm I'm Greek. Like both my parents are Greek, but church Greek just goes over my head right. and. I don't understand 90% of it, so should right. I be following her along in the books or just be praying? Well, I, th I think the example, um, I think the sort of wisdom of our tradition is sort of clear on that point and somewhat unanimous. I've been thinking a little bit more about this lately because this question has sort of come up before uh, about the, the notion of sort of praying the Jesus prayer and someone had suggested at one point that this was not sort of part of our tradition and things like that and some weird things. And I've come across even more and more things since someone raised that issue, uh, showing universally that that it is the intention or the teaching of our fathers that we'd be praying the Jesus prayer throughout the context of the liturgy, throughout the whole thing. Uh, St. Ignatius Briancheninov was the most recent one that I found who talks explicitly about praying the Jesus prayer throughout the divine liturgy. And he was speaking to people generally who would have understood uh, the language that they were, uh, you know, going to liturgy in. Um, the issue with following along uh, with service books when we're trying to sort of follow the service in a, in a language we don't know is that it can potentially transform the liturgical experience of a Christian into an intellectual activity. Um, it can end up being studying in a certain sense. Now there is some, there is some use to that sometimes, uh, but that's not the purpose of why we're there that particular day. We're there to pray. We're there to pray. If we really want to study the liturgy, we can do that at any point. We can, we can sit with the liturgical books and read them and, uh, you know, mark passages. Matushka used to that. I'll keep using her as examples. I shouldn't do this, but uh, she used to study before we went to services uh, during Holy Week when we lived in Greece for the, the you know six or so seven years we were there. She would study the liturgical books such that she would go and basically hearing a line, she would know the rest of the hymn by the point you know, by the point we left because she'd studied them before she went. She did the intellectual activity to be able to enter more prayerfully in. And uh, even Father Theodore, when I was in Greece, he used to really he would never sort of because there were times in Holy Week when I would do that, I would take out a Greek, the Greek mina, or the Greek uh, uh, Triodian and stuff, and I would try to follow along sometimes if I found I was sort of wandering a little bit. And he, I could tell that like, he never really liked that that much because he understood that the, the point of the liturgy of the our being in the liturgical circumstance was to actually pray, and that if we turn it into a study thing, it actually deprives us of the purpose. Um, so I think we're actually better off in a lot of those situations to keep our prayer rope out. To keep our prayer rope out and to 
by keeping our mind pure of thoughts, we will actually enter into any into the content that's beyond the words of what's going on in the, in the service. And we'll leave feeling the same type of regeneration we might have felt if we'd understood every single word from and maybe more if we, than if we'd understood every word from beginning to end. Because uh, the danger with the danger with the textual approach to prayer in a lot of cases, um, if we're not extremely watchful in how we do it, the fathers teach that the intellectual content of reading a prayer and the intellectual content of thinking are only like a fraction of a hair away from each other. So we can very easily go from reading to thinking, develop thoughts. We can read the Psalter from beginning to end, but the, there's a very good chance that because of the intellectual content of the Psalter that's combined with the, the prayers of David, uh, we're going to get ourselves wrapped up in the intellect and our thought will just go bounce, bounce, bounce down to, to other things. And we'll find that we're still reading, but the mind has actually gone on to a whole other universe. And we've read, you know, seven pages of prayers, but we're, we're all over the place because the, the activity is so close to the activity of reading uh, that we don't have enough time to catch our mind when we're, when we're wandering. And so we're wandering a lot when we're reading prayers from books. Um, the, the advantage with the Jesus prayer is we catch ourselves really quickly or generally more quickly uh, when our mind starts to wander and we get into that sort of sphere of intellectual thought. And so we can call our mind back and sort of rebuke ourselves a little bit. Um, so that being said, generally, I think um, it's advisable probably to avoid using the books and the services as much as we can. Uh, that's not to say there's moments when we struggle and we may, we may find there's occasions where it maybe is a little bit better for us to follow. Uh, even the process where we're sort of getting to know things a little bit in the beginning. Um, but I think the idea is to eventually sort of get away from that. Move our, if we're going to study, we can do the study other times and really try to make the, uh, do our study so we get to know the services, the parts of the service, those types of things outside of it. And that way when we're there, we can sort of really begin to focus on prayer. Because like I said, the danger is the more we use books, the more likely we're going to end up in, in sort of intellectual activities and trapped in thoughts the whole time we're, we're there. And we'll, we might think by the end that we spent all this time praying because we held our book open in front of us the whole time, but we might have just thought endless thoughts the whole time too. So I don't know if that's a direct enough answer, but. Father, every Orthodox Christian that is baptized, or rather a baptized Orthodox Christian, is given a guardian angel. What purpose does the guardian angel serve exactly for every Orthodox Christian? Like, what is the ultimate role of that guardian angel? Well, I mean, the angel, the angels are there to pray for us and to uh, continue by their prayers to, to ensure that we're sort of continuing on the good path that's consistent with our baptism. Um, they're also there uh, to weep for us when we've fallen away from things and, you know, to offer repent, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of repentance to God for us on our behalf, their sorrow, I guess, but rather than their repentance, their sorrow to God for our falls. Um, so they, insofar as the, 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 our guardian angels have those two purposes mainly, um, they perform a huge function for us. Because if the prayers of the saints can, uh, you know, if the prayers of the saints can do things like putting off the time of the last, of the final judgment and things like that, uh, you know, imagine what the prayers of the angels do for our sake. And so though we might not see them sort of, you know, constantly or be aware of their presence, by performing those two main functions, they've uh, they've done a significant thing for us. Hi, Father. Can you hear me? Yes. I thought you were recording at the beginning. I'm so sorry. I'm so. No, don't worry. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask: Is Orthodox marriage the only marriage that's valid? Or are other marriages valid? Because I'm very confused. Thank you. 
canonically speaking, uh, yes, Orthodox marriage is, is the only thing that's recognized by the Orthodox Church. Um, it, and that's shown to us in a variety, in, you know, in a number of ways, uh, canonically speaking. When I say canonically speaking, I mean according to the canons of the Church. Uh, for example, if an Orthodox Christian, uh, you know, God forbid, as, as does happen on occasion, if an Orthodox Christian marries a non-Orthodox in a non-Orthodox church, in a non-Orthodox, uh, you know, within the context of a non-Orthodox confession, I guess is the way to put it, um, they can't commune. According to St. Nicodemus, once someone has done that, they're only allowed to commune once they, uh, if they become deathly ill. And they're only supposed to receive antiteron occasionally as an encouragement so that they don't fall into complete despair. So it's viewed as a very serious thing, uh, partaking of, for an Orthodox Christian to partake of marriage, quote unquote, outside of the context of the Orthodox Church. Um, if we look at the sacraments as uh, belonging to Christ, because it's, it's, the sacraments all belong to Christ, they're, they're his things, um, it's impossible for something that belongs to Christ to be given outside of his body. They can't actually bestow it. Now, that's not to say that um, God doesn't look favorably, in a sense, upon a marriage between two non-Orthodox Christians where they give themselves to each other in love uh, and true self-sacrifice. That can become a cause of his relating to them and desiring to draw them closer to himself. So if a non if non orthodox who are married outside of the orthodox should use marriage well, uh, God looks upon that sacrificial action, and uh, that can become just a, a further cause for His desiring to bring them closer to Himself, or, or taking the opportunity to bring them closer to Himself, uh, just like any other sort of self sacrificial action outside of the orthodox church. Um, th those virtues don't go don't go entirely wasted. God sees them, and uh, because of them. Uh, see, uh, looks for opportunities to draw those people closer to himself. Um, but in terms of marriage, the you know marriage, which is the a sacrament that can only exist within the Orthodox Church. I just wanted to ask about the guardian angel as well. Are they also there to protect us? Like, can they prevent us from getting into a car accident or anything? Just. There and, as protection. I mean, if the saints can do that by their prayers and things, the, the angels are even more capable. So, I mean, there's lots of stuff in our tradition. If you look at, uh, it's looked upon in our tradition as a very sorrowful thing to have grieved one's guardian angel, and uh, therefore to have sort of deprived oneself of his his or his protection. So, insofar as that's a grievous thing, I think we have to say, yeah, they, there's probably all sorts of things that they they're capable of doing by their intercessions. An activity in our lives. Papa, thanks again so much for spending your time with us, and uh, God willing, in two weeks as we uh, go on our Lenten homilies. Uh, usually, we're uh, we're on Tuesdays, but this year, the Brotherhood is offering uh, free chanting lessons on Tuesdays. So, yeah, we've, yeah. so glory to God for that. So we've uh, have to put our homilies on Thursdays, as we know. Uh, the majority of churches uh, serve uh, pre-sanctified liturgy Wednesday nights, so our, we don't want, of course, displace anyone from going to church. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. And so, God willing, in two weeks, we'll rejoin with you again. Uh, we go through our Lenten journey. Uh, we ask for your prayers. And okay. Christ God willing, like I said, we'll, oh. uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll uh, join you again. If we could ask for your closing prayers, please. Thank you. Christ, the true light, who God enlightened and sanctify every man that cometh into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may see the unapproachable light, and guide our steps to the performance of thy commandments. By the intercessions of thine all immaculate mother and of all thy saints. Amen. To the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Kalinita, Kalikarati, Otopuma. Kalisara Kustipapa, thank you. Jesus.